afternoon, everybody. I am David Daly. I'm the author of Rat Fucked. Am I allowed to say that on Facebook Live? I hope so, because I just did. Um, I'm also the former editor-in-chief of uh, Salon and now a senior fellow at Fair Vote. I am here with uh, Zach Rosen, uh, who is the author yeah. of... Oh, I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> I, I know you uh, know my name. I know, I know your name. I'm, it's the, the pressure of Facebook Live. I'm here with Zachary Roth, the author of... Rat fucked, no. <laughs> the author of the terrific book, The Great Suppression, and a former national reporter for MSNBC. Um, we've written similar books in that we are both um, very interested in the assault on democracy that has taken place over the last uh, several years and sort of the deteriorating conditions under which we find yeah. our republic. Um, we certainly are in one of these places where there is a story just about every day that yeah. reminds ourselves of, of, of just how broken and extreme and dysfunctional that um, things have become. Um, you see it in the, in the fight over, over Obamacare, and you see it over that today that there is a Supreme Court hearing uh, happening, and there was also a justice nominated a year ago who did not get one of these hearings. Um, yeah. So certainly that is a piece of the assault on this. We have the gerrymandered legislatures in so many states working on assaults on voting rights um, that have uh, gone after the, the right to assemble, the right to uh, protest. Yeah. Um, we woke up after election day in a country that has been deeply divided, very polarized, but also essentially split largely down the middle. We live in a kind of a 50-50 country, but it's one that Republicans control just about all of the levers of power. 69 of 99 state the legislative chambers a modern record of 33 governors, uh, trifectas in 25 states, that's both legislative chambers and the governor. How do you explain how the country can be as divided, uh, largely equally, as this, and yet Republicans control so much of the actual institutional power? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's a great way of framing the question, and, and the short answer is because we have a political system that does not come close to accurately representing the popular will, um, and you can go down the line. So talk about the presidency. Um, more people, as we know, three, nearly three million more people voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump, uh, but because of the Electoral College and its clearly undemocratic nature, which gives more power to rural voters who happen to be white, um, Donald Trump is president. Uh, in Congress, I don't need to tell you that Republicans gerrymandered in a number of major states so that, that there were, I believe, a, a very, by a very small amount, more Americans voted for Republican members of Congress than Democratic ones this time, uh, but certainly not by the margin that's reflected in the House. And in fact, after the 2012 election, you had, I think, 10 million more votes for Democratic members, but you still had Republicans controlling the House. In the Senate, that sort of gerrymandered by design, where right. the small states back at the founding insisted on having s states represented two senators per state, regardless of the population of each state, uh, in order to maintain their political clout. And at, that, at the time, that was one thing. There was, I think, a 13 to 1 difference between the largest state, Virginia, and the smallest, Delaware. Today, that's blown even more out of proportion. There are 69 times more people in California than in Wyoming, yet they both have two senators. So again, just a, an in, a failure by our political system to accurately reflect what people want. And then to go into the state legislatures, you have the effect of gerrymandering there, of course. Um, and you also have, a, across all of this, restrictions on the right to vote, which have had a real impact, especially in certain states, in keeping certain demographics of voters, racial minorities, the young, the poor, all who tend to vote Democratic, uh, away from the ballot box. One of the amazing things about the 2016 election is everybody says, well, you can't 
gerrymander a presidential election? Well, one way you can is when these gerrymandered legislatures systematically assault voting rights. And there's a pattern in all of these states, um, whether it's North Carolina, whether it's Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan, when you see a Republican trifecta in many of these states, the first thing they do often, the pattern is pretty clear, is go after, is go after voting rights. Um, so you see these extreme voter ID bills, you see the kinds of limitations on absentee, on absentee ballots, yep. on mail-in ballots, on voter early voting, on registration, on automatic registration, yep. on mail-in registration, and we see the effects of this. The effects of this clearly is to dampen a democratic turnout and to dampen minority turnout. Um, have you noticed that pattern in all of these gerrymandered states? And if so, do you think that there's reforms that could be enacted to go after it? It amazes me that the Democrats in the states where they do have some control don't embrace more of a pro-democracy, yeah. small-D agenda, and work hard to expand the franchise yeah. to do automatic registration. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, it's undeniable that this pattern exists, and you're starting to see more and more people, and even in some cases the courts, um, identifying that pattern where um, the same state that's passing a strict voter ID law uh, is, that discriminates against racial minorities is also passing a redistricting plan that discriminates against minorities in the case of Texas. And you could actually say a similar thing about North Carolina potentially, and maybe even Wisconsin. Um, and in North Carolina, you could even throw in, once, the, once a Democratic governor was elected in November, they then used the lame duck session to undermine the new governor's powers, um, which was just struck down by a court. But all of these things are similar in terms of using every kind of Play every tool in the toolkit to um, undermine the, both the power of the Democratic Party and to boost the Republican partisan interests, but also really in a direct sense to undermine the power of voters to elect the representatives of their choice and to have the policy outcomes they want. Um, in terms of your, your question about uh, how to address that, um, I think we are starting to see movement for a positive pro-voter um, set of expansive policies, automatic voter registration mm -hmm. being the, the one that's kind of caught fire the most, where you've had, uh, I believe, six states now, just in the last two years, passing versions of automatic voter registration. You also see some states um, expanding early voting, making voter registration easier to do online, uh, all of these types of things. Um, there was even a bill introduced in New York State just in the last few days um, that would uh, go the sort of next step and, and require mandatory voting. It's not going to go anywhere, but that's a, an issue that's been kind of bubbling up a little bit and being talked about, and I think that's a sign that progressives in general and kind of pro-democracy advocates are starting to have that, that larger conversation about how do we, instead of just fighting back against these restrictive laws, how do we move in the other direction and actually expand voting? And of course, you're seeing resistance to that uh, among Republicans. And, and this is a bit of a tangent, but one of the, th the things that I argue in, in my book um, is that that resistance um, to, to expanding access to voting and that support for restricting voting uh, is not only a result of partisan considerations, so though of course it is largely driven by that. Republicans understand that at this point the, the sort of party's bases are such that the, the fewer people that vote, the better Republicans do. The more people that vote, Democrats do, the better Democrats do. But um, yeah, it's also a, a, a sort of manifestation of a much deeper underlying ideology, I argue, um, that, that conservatives, many conservatives, I should say, have, have shared since the founding that really is distrustful of democracy as a concept and of the effect of giving political power to ordinary people and kind of undermining the power of elites. And I think you're, you're seeing that um, kind of bubble to the surface in the last few years, particularly since Obama became president. And, and that's part of what we're living with today. And Donald Trump, I think, has been quite skillful in kind of playing on that, in, in summoning these fears, not just that people are gonna be voting illegally, 
because uh, you know we all understand that that's essentially made up but that giving political power to ordinary people whether it's immigrants or um, racial minorities or poor people um, it is going to uh, be detrimental to the values that that um, a certain group of voters uh, holds dear and that's really kind of at the core of this fear that was a very long answer to your question but um, but I, I'm interested in your answer to something, uh, which is that we've had a lot of news lately about this effort by Eric Holder, supported mm -hmm. by President Obama, um, to, I can't quite tell if it's to, to get Democrats into the redistricting game too, so that they can be just as partisan and ruthless as Republicans, or to um, support things like independent commissions, which would actually kind of go further from a good government sense to fixing the problem, but some combination of that. Um, do you think that that effort is likely to succeed, and what would they need to do to make it successful? I think that the Democrats have finally woken up from their slumber. I think the Democrats in 2010 not only did not have the imagination to come up with the audacious redistricting play called Red Map that the Republicans really brilliantly executed, but that they also announced fairly publicly. I mean, I mean, Karl Rove in the Wall Street Journal in March of 2010 writes an op-ed piece in which he makes it really clear that the Republicans were going to plot their rise back to power after the big Obama win in 2008 through redistricting. Right. And Rove lays out that there's 117 state legislative races that are key to redistricting because it would tip control of legislative chambers in the Republican direction and allow the Republicans to be the only party in the room when it came time to draw the lines the following year after the census, lines that would define power in the states and also in Congress. Right. Those 117 seats, Rove writes, would create the power to draw 193 of the national congressional seats of 435. That gives you a pretty good advantage. So the, the Democrats lack the imagination to pull this off and then the ability to even play defense against something that is laid out in staggering detail on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal. They are attempting now to figure out a road back. There is a lot more attention being paid down ballot. You saw it in the battle for the chairmanship of the DNC right. that everybody was talking again about how do we re-energize down ballot? It is a really difficult road back. Um, President Obama and his former Attorney General Eric Holder have announced that they're going to run something called the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, which is essentially trying to be an umbrella organization to pull together the various Democratic campaign committees that have a role in redistricting. So it's the Democratic Governors Association, the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, and the Democratic Congressional Campaign right. Committee. Um, essentially the establishment, the campaign arms of the party. There's also a litigation wing that's being run by Mark Elias, who's right. a, a terrific litigator, and it's Elias and litigation that has actually had right. the greatest amount of success when it has come to the Democrats and redistricting right. in recent years. Um, I am not seeing, still to this day even, a true understanding amongst these organizations or these leaders of the massive structural hole that they're in. I understand that these people are partisans and consultants and that they need to be optimistic and to believe that there is an electoral path forward. But in so many of these states, you already have the majority of people voting Democratic, but often a super majority of Republican legislators. Right. To overcome that at the ballot box is going to take probably upwards of 60% of the vote in some of these states. Uh, I mean, in Michigan in the last uh, three cycles, you've had more votes for Democrats at the state house level right. than Republicans, and yet Republicans have maintained these massive majorities. Right. For the Democrats to undo this in Michigan, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, in Florida, and in Wisconsin, which 
all of which are, are largely blue slash blue purple states, right. and all states in which the Democrats are in such an electoral hole right. that you can't simply fight back the old way of trying to win elections. In a lot of these states, uh, they can't even find candidates. These districts are so warped right. and tilted that in Wisconsin in 2016, on the assembly side, 47 of 99 seats went uncontested. Right. In North Carolina, 57 of 120 legislative seats went uncontested. People think they can't win these races. To a large extent, they are right. And President Obama is out there saying, lace up your sneakers, grab a clipboard, right. and become an organizer. So what the should problem they be doing? is structural. So they should be focusing more on lawsuits. Yes, I mean, I think that the, the, the litigation route has been the only route that has been effective right. for the Democrats and that they have to focus there. I do believe that the Whitford case, the efficiency gap a case coming out of Wisconsin yeah. right now, which could lead to the first, the Supreme Court ruling that defines partisan gerrymandering in the history of the country yeah. uh, is a potential game changer. But I think Democrats and others who believe in reform, if the Democrats think that they can run blue map and undo this in 2020, yeah. they're going to have less money, no element of surprise, and incredibly tilted maps yeah. to run on. Um, I don't think that that is a road back. We have to think about a litigation that gets us to actual fairness, but then we have to be thinking about the kinds of structural democratic reforms that can lead to actual change. So this is where you start to, to think about instant runoff voting. This is where you think about top two and top four primaries. Right. This is where you think about all of the different things that we can do to reinvigorate our democracy, to bring back dialogue and compromise and right. conversation, all of which these districts have pushed out in a, in a drive Right. to the extremes. Right. And of course the danger is that if Democrats do fail to, to win control in these states in 2020, then Republicans have the chance to do it all over again in 2021. And, and the technology is not getting worse. Right. The technology that made this so, the, the technology that etched these district lines in such stone is only going to be better, more dangerous, and more predictive by 2021. Um, if I'm a Democratic consultant right now, the only elections that I'm interested in are the governor's races in 2017 in Virginia, right. and then in 2018 right. in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Wisconsin. Right. Because governors in those states have veto power over bad maps. Right. Democrats are not going to win back chambers in probably any of those states right. anytime soon. But if you can win one statewide election, you could at least have veto power over, over a bad right. map and get yourself kind of in the room and perhaps put us on a road back to some right. kind of fairness. I'm going to make a prediction now for, for the next way that Republicans are going to undermine democracy on the state level. And I, I assume they're not watching this video because it's not <laughs> given many ideas, but there's going to be a Democratic governor elected in one of those states while, while there's a Republican legislature in, in the 2018 election, whether Wisconsin, Iowa, Ohio, Florida, or that's Michigan. Yes. Uh, in one of those states where that happens, they're going to do what they did in North Carolina, where in the lame duck session, they're going to change the way that the redistricting works and undermine the power of the governor so he can't control it anymore. And then they're going to still have free reign to redistrict in the way that they want. That seem plausible. Why do we not have like a, stunned, like why do we not have like a glass of wine with us <laughs> for this? Because um, sometimes I find it really difficult to have these conversations without a drink in hand. Um, I had not thought of it in quite that way. Um, but it, once you think about it, it's obvious. Once you think right? of it, it just seems like of course that's what they're going to do. Right. I mean, I've been impressed by the strategy of going after Secretary of State offices right. across the country, of, of sort of pushing the, the Republican right. efforts further down ballot. It's the Secretaries of State that run so many right. of, of the actual election procedures right. in our states, but they also oversee ballot initiatives. Right. And 
as Democrats have tried to fight back in states where they do not have legislative power, they have tried to put things on the ballot. Right. And it's the secretaries of state that approve the language of the ballot initiative, right. the placement of the initiatives, and the actual mechanisms of the elections. Right. So you have seen a, a push, and Republicans now hold more than 60% of, of those seats right. across the country. And again, you can't necessarily gerrymander those seats. Right. It's, it's, it's attention to detail. It's, it's actual political strategy to say, we understand how the system works and we are going to attempt to right. take power every place we can. Right. Um, and Democrats did, did run an effort to win some of those contested Secretary of yeah. State races, um, at least in 2014. Uh, and didn't end up having much to show for it. Right. It's, 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 it's complicated. Um, where do you see the modern roots of this coming from? Um, how much blame do you put on, on things like Citizens United for the, the hole we find ourselves in? Um, I, I certainly uh, would attribute the Citizens United ruling and some other uh, Supreme Court rulings of the Obama era um, would say they're responsible for a vast change in the landscape of campaign financing um, and, and for a flood of money, often dark money, uh, into the political process. I, I think it's, and that's its own issue of democracy and it has clearly given more influence uh, to billionaires and to corporations uh, than they had previously and less influence to ordinary people. Um, I wouldn't say it has allowed billionaires to buy elections. I think it's not quite that simple, um, but it's certainly uh, swayed things in that direction. I think it's difficult to draw a line, a direct line, from that to specific election results. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that has allowed this situation to, to go on, um, because it it's, can be difficult to identify the exact um, result. But I, you do see studies that show um, Congress and, and elected officials are clearly um, more attuned to the preferences of rich people and of campaign contributors and of the, the demographics that are more likely to be campaign contributors than to ordinary people. And you see the, the distorted effect of that in, in certain policy outcomes. Um, just, just to take a, a minor example, but the, something like the carried interest loophole, which nobody thinks is a good idea. And, and if it were anything other than a huge benefit to extremely wealthy Americans who tend to be campaign contributors, uh, it wouldn't continue to exist. Um, but, but that's a very concrete effect of how money has kind of warped political outcomes. Um, I think the combination of, of the evisceration of campaign finance regulations with the voting restrictions we've been talking about, with the gerrymandering we've been talking about, uh, with a number of other developments, has um, altogether sort of undermined American democracy in a way that has given much less power uh, to ordinary people. And I, so I think when you see it all together, that's what's especially troubling. Um, let me ask you about, we have a question from the audience. We don't have a question from the audience. <laughs> let me ask you about, um, you, you were you we were talking before and and we were talking about coverage of demo, democracy and voting issues um, and 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 you were talking about things that that you think current coverage isn't isn't perhaps doing very well. Let me ask you to expand on that. Sure. Um, well, let me start by giving you a chance to um, plug the terrific project you are working on that is. Is, is going a long way, I think, towards calling attention to a lot of these issues. If someone wants to sign up for the Daily Democracy, where do they do that? Uh, they can go to the dailydemocracy.org uh, and click on the links that says subscribe to my newsletter. It's a twice weekly newsletter uh, that gives you all the latest news and analysis of these democracy issues. Um, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. Excellent. Um, I think. I think we start by covering these issues in a more rigorous and sustained way that understands the context in which they operate in. Nothing made me more frustrated during the 2016 campaign than all of the stories about, can the Democrats take back the House? And you would see these in the New York Times 
in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, in really good newspapers written by really veteran political reporters, and they would manage to write 1,500 words on this topic without mentioning the words redistricting or gerrymandering. Right. And um, it, would, um, it would drive me insane because the answer was no. The Democrats were not going to take back the House last year and there were specific structural reasons why right. that go back to the, the way that these lines were intentionally drawn to withstand a wave. Right. And on the occasional times when people would nod to the structural advantage, right. it would be because of the way districts are drawn. Right. That was the language that would appear in so many of these stories time and again that you almost began to believe that it was house uh, style. Right. And these are not lines that appeared from nowhere. Right. These lines were drawn by partisans for the benefit of partisans. Right. And to not be clear about the problems we face makes it impossible for us to talk seriously about how we fix them. Right. If we continue to talk like these districts were handed down on a tablet, that this is simply the way the system works, we are not getting ourselves any closer to an honest discussion yeah. of it. And I think reporters have a responsibility to lay bare what has actually happened to our political system. Yeah. It has been captured by the extremes. It was captured intentionally and it was driven there. It's not the way, it's not simply the way that it's done. Yeah. It's the way that it was done to us. Um, and sometimes objective reporters and mainstream publications aren't, aren't comfortable calling out yeah. partisan motivations or they want to suggest that both sides do it. And when it comes to gerrymandering and redistricting, both sides have a long history right. of this. There are no virgins here. Um, there's, there's, there's a, you know, as long as, as lines are drawn by politicians, the politicians right. are going to find a way to do it to their advantage. But what happened in 2010 and 2011 was different, it was deeper, it's more sustained, it's more difficult to overcome at the ballot box, and it's introduced dramatic challenges to our ability to sustain a democracy. Right. And until we talk about it in exactly those terms, we are not going to get any closer right. to fixing it. And in that case, it was only one party that did it, of course. It in that case, case both, both parties. In that case, this. largely, it was it was it was one yeah. party that did. That's a yes. great that's a great point, um, and it's interesting because I felt like during at least during the 2016 campaign um, on the voting restriction stuff. Um, there, the, the coverage from a lot of the mainstream media wasn't perfect by a long way, uh, but it had taken a step forward yeah. from where it was in previous years. And, and I think that was helped by Trump's sort of brazenness in yes. talking about voter fraud, which gave even very neutral reporters the ability to, to just say objectively, studies show that significant voter fraud simply does not exist. Um, you're more likely to get struck by lightning and Etc. Uh, and and to really make clear um, what was happening here and how illegitimate it was uh, in a way that that mainstream reporting on that stuff hadn't until recently. But it sounds like on the redistricting stuff they haven't quite had that moment yet. Um, but but again, um, since the election, at least I just as a kind of more casual observer of that stuff. I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing it around more and seeing a yes. bit more of a recognition uh, about what actually happened and how that kind of undermined democracy. Do you, do you agree? I think that all of the court cases, I think that all of the protests, yeah. I mean, it's amazing to me to see hundreds of people on the street in Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina, and they're protesting genuinely. Yeah. They're out there protesting the thing that put us all to sleep in eighth grade civics class. Right on the street because people understand that the way we draw these lines is how we create the fundamental building blocks of our democracy and right. that when the lines get uh, perverted, uh, so too do you uh, corrode the right. essence of a representative democracy. Right. 
Are you optimistic about anything as we head towards <laughs> the 2018 to 2020? Why uh, don't we try to end this on a on a high note, given that there is, yeah. is nothing to drink? <laughs> um, I'm definitely optimistic. I think we're going to keep going in two directions at once, kind of. Um, I'm optimistic that blue states and potentially some purple states are going to continue to expand democracy and expand voting, um, both for partisan reasons, because Democrats are understanding that they need to do that for their political self-interest, uh, and because there, there are actual kind of pro-democracy advocates who understand that that's the right thing to do. Uh, but I think it's going to be a continuing battle on the national level. Um, Though I think in the longer term, um, I think democracy is pretty popular and um, sort of once, you know, if, if we get out of this Trump business relatively unscathed, which who knows if that will happen, um, but if we can hold on at least to the basics of our democratic system, I think things tend to move in fits and starts to be sure, but tend to move uh, in a sort of expansive direction in terms of democracy, and I, I, I would expect that's the way they'll keep going. Um, but I, I also wanted to, to, um, to sort of make a different point, um, which is that, and, and ask what you think of it, which is that a lot of all of these issues that we're talking about, what it's made clear to me is that um, I, I used to think that there was a consensus around democracy that um, we may disagree about, about the economy or about a healthcare system or about foreign policy or whatever, uh, but we all agree on democracy as the way to resolve those differences. It, it feels to me like there, there is at least a vanguard of the conservative movement that doesn't believe in democracy and is very skeptical of it and is eager to undermine it at every chance that it gets. And then a, a larger public uh, that doesn't really care that much either way. That, that there are progressives who care, and I'm very encouraged by that activism, and I don't want to write it off, uh, but that there's a lot you can get away with while the vast majority of people kind of aren't paying that much attention that really goes in the direction of undermining democracy in, in a very dangerous way, um, both in terms of these kind of election mechanics issues of voting restrictions and gerrymandering and money in politics, and also in the larger sense that we talk about democracy in terms of freedom of the press, freedom of speech, civil liberties, all the kind of underlying conditions that make democracy possible. And I think one of the things Trump is showing, as I say, um, is that you can start to undermine that stuff um, and there's, there's going to be less outrage than maybe we would have thought. People are not as quick to, to notice it and, and to jump on it and to stop it. Uh, than maybe I had hoped. I, that you asked for an optimistic thing. That's a, a pessimistic, but I don't know if you agree. I do. I think our institutions are are very are very weaker, precarious than we ones, and that the status of our democracy is more easily tipped over than perhaps yeah. we imagined it could be. I mean, I'm um, I genuinely don't approach these questions as a partisan, but as somebody who thinks that the side with the most votes right. ought to, ought to you know, right. win, uh, that you know, that is the essence of a representative democracy. And um, you don't, ha you can look at the states that have enacted these kinds of voting the suppression efforts, and they have something in common one party is in control of all of them, and that party tends to be the Republican Party. Um, I think it's something like, I think it's approaching 25 states now that have enacted new voting yeah. restrictions yeah. since the 2010 election, yeah. and I believe it's something like 22 of them that yeah. have, and I, I could be off slightly on that, but I'm in the ballpark, yeah. that have complete Republican yeah. trifecta control, a handful of them have had a Democratic governor. Yeah. Um, when this happened in Rhode Island and in New Hampshire, I believe. Yeah, West Virginia. In West Virginia. So there's a trend and there's a pattern, and it's a disturbing pattern. And one of the things that I would have hoped for was that you would see I would have wished that there were more voices in the Democratic Party that were speaking up louder for a small-D Democratic agenda. Yeah. But I also 
really imagine that you would see more voices in the Republican Party speaking up for a small d Democratic agenda. Yeah. And that's it's been, been disconcerting none. that it simply doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Um, you know, occasionally Lindsey Graham will make a, a murmuring in that really? direction. Uh, but it just, it, it, it never seems yeah. like, it never seems like enough. Yeah. Um, and it never seems fully committed to the kind of small d, small c constitutional yeah. um, ideals that it seemed to me we all held relatively dear. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, Zach's terrific book is The Great Suppression, and you want to go sign up for his democracy newsletter, uh, thedailydemocracy.org. My book, uh, just because it's fun to say rat fucked on Facebook, is called Rat Fucked, and you can find the more information about these democracy reforms as well over on fairvote.org. Thank you, everybody.